So it's 708 um, due to the amount of content, and the amount of space that we want to have for discussion tonight. Uh, we'll go ahead and get going with tonight's webinar. So hello, everyone. Um, thank you again for joining us tonight on Wednesday, April 22nd. I know what Right now with this uh, weird times with COVID-19 and having to stay inside, a lot of our schedules are um, reduced to staying at home and uh, working with what we have to do for our academic and professional careers. Uh, so thank you for hopping in tonight. Uh, for tonight's webinar, which is April 30th, 1975, Viewing the War in Vietnam with Equity and Mindfulness. And this has been put together by uh, UVSA Midwest internal staff. And a big thank you to the executive board and our board of directors for helping us out with this. All right, so before I have to submit introductions, so my name is Christine Malay. I am the content manager for UVS Midwest. I go to Wichita State University, and my pronouns are she or hers. And a fun fact about me is that I have one monolith and one double island. Hello folks, I'm Justin Lay. I am a video artist for UVA Sydney West internal staff. I go by the pronouns he, him, his. Um, I am an alum from the University of Iowa. And a fun fact about me is that I love Naruto. I've watched uh, Naruto and Naruto Shippuden, I think four times over. It's like, I think 700, at least 700 episodes. So I'm a huge Naruto fan. Hi guys, my name is Carolyn Lowe. I go by the pronouns she, her, hers, and I'm from the University of Iowa, and I'm the CPP coordinator. Uh, a fun fact about me is that I have a black belt in Taekwondo, and we also have Nick. Look, he goes by he, him, his. He's not going to be here tonight, unfortunately, but he's our web designer and video artist, and his fun fact is that he's a DJ. He goes by Brick. So we're going to open the floor up to you guys now. Um, so we're going to have you guys uh, share your name, your year, where you're from, your school, uh, whether you guys like graduated or you're still attending, and how did you hear, how did VSA open up your cultural experiences? So I'll popcorn it to Kevin. Hi, my name's Kevin Van. Uh, I'm a senior and I currently attend IU Bloomington. And I felt that VSA opened up my cultural experiences just because I felt like I had a community. I think in my hometown, I didn't feel like I had like a good Asian or Vietnamese community. So it made me more proud to be Vietnamese and to learn a little bit more about it. Um, I'll popcorn it to uh, Linda. Hi everyone, my name is Linda. I am currently a senior and I also go to Indiana University. And, you, and VSA opened up my cultural experience in a way that, like Kevin, I found a community at college when going into it, I was really nervous not about um, meeting new people and things like that, but also it helped me um, independently expand on um, what it really means to be Vietnamese by meeting other people, not just at IU, but at other schools as well. Um, popcorn to Cindy. Did you say Cindy? Sorry. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> my name is Cindy When I am already graduated. I'm from Kansas, but I currently live in Washington. Um, and then for the question, um, so I grew up in a predominantly white community, like a lot of you guys um, on this call too can probably relate, uh, but I didn't have very many Vietnamese friends growing up. And um, throughout the years with BSA work and UVSA Midwest, I've kind of um, built a network full of friends and um, a lot of business professionals where um, I've been able to be more exposed to my own culture and to um, just a lot more friendships. So yeah, popcorn, let's see, Tagana? 
Thanks, Cindy. Hi, everyone. My name is Tiana Vanle. Um, I graduated from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, um, VSA, and UVSA Midwest, I think, really, um, not only like other folks that I've shared opened up like a community that I didn't have back at home, but also like deepened the nuance and how I understood like what it meant to be like Viet, um, as there are folks like across the Midwest and also state by state, region, region, international, national, that um, have different experiences and relationships with their identity. So it, I, I think it added a level of um, complexity that really, made me drive to understand like my relationship to like what it means to be a Viet person. Popcorn Sarah. Uh, hello, my name is Sarah. I'm currently a junior at IU Indiana University Bloomington. And um, Viet, uh, as many of you know, um, I'm not Viet, but I think that obviously has um, uh, VSC has obviously allowed me to learn about his culture and um, not only about, like about Vietnam but also the nuances of what it uh, could possibly mean to be Viet American here because that's uh, the predominant uh, like population in this community so I think being able to witness that um, really showed me um, that culture and uh, just both uh, the Vietnamese culture and what it could mean to be Viet American. Um, popcorn, uh, Elizabeth. Hi, um, hi, I'm Elizabeth Dang. I will be graduating in less than two weeks from the Ohio State University. And VSA definitely, um, VSA UBSA definitely helped me open up my cultural experiences. Um, like uh, Cindy had mentioned, like growing up in predominantly white areas, you didn't, I didn't really feel connected except for like maybe the local church community, but I also didn't attend as much. So then going into university and being able to resonate with a lot of the experiences and stories of my peers really helped me um, feel comfortable with who I was and strengthen that identity while also exploring together the different aspects of culture and heritage and just being able to um, recognize like where we have room to grow but also being able to like appreciate like how much we've already um, educated and taught ourselves to. Um, I'm going to popcorn it over to Mickey. Hello, can you guys hear me? Hi, hello. Oh, wait, am I on? I'm sorry, I'm on mobile. Okay, great. Okay, hi, my name is Mickey. Um, I am a fourth year graduating, hopefully in August 2020. Um, I go to the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and um, VSN UVSN Midwest opened up my culture experiences uh, a lot. Actually, like a lot of what everybody else has been saying. I also grew up in like a predominantly white area, and just going up to um, college allowed me to understand more to discuss like the different issues within the Vietnamese Asian American um, community, and it really just helped me realize like that these things are able to be discussed and we are able to discuss it with a bunch of people. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know who hasn't gone yet. I'm sorry. So Linda, has Linda gone yet? I've gone. Oh, oops. Allison hasn't. Oh, Allison, go ahead. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, my name is Allison Nguyen and I graduated from the University of Minnesota. Uh, how did I open up my cultural experiences? Uh, yeah, so very similar to like everyone else. I grew up in a pretty white like community and then there wasn't very many Vietnamese people even though there were some other Asian groups. But uh, joining BSA and UBSA Midwest, uh, it really let me learn more, I guess, well, one, it made me find a community of people that kind of like understood the exact same upbringing that I had, as well as like things I would feel like only me or my brother would like understand that like my other friends wouldn't get. Like people also knew how those were and like were able to like provide me insight with how they would deal with like struggles or insecurities and things like that. 
and I realized like it's kind of like part of the cultural upbringing that I had so that was really nice um but yeah and then just like through events and things like I guess I learned more things about traditional Vietnamese culture just because I don't know I guess I didn't know as much as I thought I did but yeah it was kind of great to learn all that over the years um popcorn to Alex hello um so my name is Alex Cole um my, I graduated from Indiana University, Bloomington. Uh, and for the question with about cultural experience, um, I guess for my upbringing, I was relatively close with my Vietnamese community. Um, I always hung out with the older folks typically. Um, so I guess joining like VSA and starting up VSA at IU um, after taking Nathan's adv uh, advice, uh, it definitely exposed me to a lot of different perspectives, um, <clears throat> such as like Allison's perspective, uh, for, for example, or Sarah Liao's perspective. Um, and that experience definitely got, you know, definitely widened all of my thoughts, especially interacting with the international Vietnamese uh, within my organization that was a real treat to see how diverse we all can be but still go behind one ideal which is what brings us all together is vsa and our heritage um i'll popcorn it to maya powers also in this room. hello can you hear me okay yeah we can hear you okay um so i'm maya powers um wait let me see if i can okay <laughs> i'm maya powers um i'm currently a junior at uic uh university of illinois at chicago um how did i how did i join vsa so i joined vsa at uic my freshman year um oh wait how did it open up to cultural experience oh yeah so i've always kind of wanted to learn more about like different cultures and VSA at UIC was a really good space to do that. And they were so welcoming. And even though I'm not of Vietnamese descent, I'm Mexican, like I still felt very welcomed. Um, and like through UVSA Midwest events and also VSA events, I have learned more about myself by learning about other people, if that makes sense. So it's just been like a really rewarding experience, like getting just to learn new things and yeah. And then uh, Maya, you can- Oh, I popcorn to somebody? Okay. Um, uh, did Andy Trung go already? No, I did not. I just okay. realized. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. So, hello guys, my name is Andy Trung. Um, probably see my Zoom name is like my line name. <laughs> I forgot to change it after like we had a call. But I'm currently a senior at UIC. Um, expected to graduate probably next, uh, next spring. And I currently go to UIC. So for the question, um, growing up, I guess I wasn't actually as involved in my Vietnamese community. I had a lot of Vietnamese friends and I joined like little things, organizations, but I didn't really learn much about um, uh, our culture. So definitely going into UIC, um, joining VSA and being more involved with UVSA helped open my mindset more about like these different issues and cultural like awareness things that I wasn't aware of as a kid. So I'm, uh, it's definitely impacted me a lot because I didn't realize like there was these many issues that involved within our community. So I'm pretty like grateful for that. And I'm still learning obviously because there's like more things that are like coming back and maybe I was just like familiar with it. So yeah. Um, I don't know who went because I kind of joined a little bit late <laughs> if anyone wants to. Tyson. Tyson. I can jump in. Sure. Thank you. Um, hey everyone, my name is Tyson Bond. Uh, I graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison four years ago um, and currently living in Chicago and I'm also on the board of directors for UVSA Midwest. Um, within VSA, I joined VSA back in 2011 when I was a freshman and uh, very similar to other people's stories where I came from a predominantly white background um, and 
I, I think at first it was difficult to get into the space because it was a space that was so foreign to me. It was foreign to be around other Asians, let alone like being around other Vietnamese people and like Vietnamese uh, uh, people like, who have experience with Vietnamese culture. So it was really uh, uncomfortable for me at first. And at first, like I didn't want to go to VSA events. I didn't want to uh, go to VSA parties and like get to meet these people because like they were so foreign to me and it was like something that I was so uncomfortable with. But um, as, as time moved on and, and as I met more people, you know, it was just a lot easier to um, not have to explain myself uh, when it comes to things that are like Asian related or like Vietnamese related. And so I think like having this space uh, within VSA and UVSA Midwest like opens up uh, these opportunities for, for uh, genuine uh, relationship building and, and experiences that you just wouldn't get uh, outside of this space. Uh, and then within UVSA Midwest, I feel like uh, UVSA Midwest focuses a lot on leadership development and personal development. And uh, this offers an opportunity into us as future leaders uh, to develop ourselves and invest our, in ourselves so that we can become um, you know, outstanding individuals within our community. Uh, whatever your community is. Um, I'll popcorn over to Isabel. Oh, hi guys. Um, I'm Isabel No. I graduated from UW-Madison um, two years ago, and UV UVSA Midwest opened up my cultural experience with um, events like this where, you know, they're education-based, cultural-based, um, and it really opened up a lot of opportunity for me to learn more about my culture, which my parents never really involved me in growing up. Um, so same as a lot of you, um, just all the events hosted by UVSA and even my local VSA allowed me to learn more about Vietnamese culture. Sweet. And then I think we may have a couple more. Um, Eric, you want to go next? Um, I'll out the cut in uh just right now uh thank you everyone for sharing i really appreciate um you all sharing your experiences um and being here tonight as we provide this space for us to kind of all talk about um for the sake of time we'll have to kind of get going um just to make sure that we can get through um what we want to get through uh to have this space and be able to discuss um, and share our own experiences and our opinions uh, so thank you for understanding, but thank you um, everyone for sharing and for being here. I'm glad to see you all. Um, I know my screen's not working, so you can't see my face, but smiling and just like trying to show my excitement, but you can't see me, it's just a blank screen. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Um, so for tonight's discussion uh, is this webinar on April 30th, 1975. This is a rather contested topic in our communities as we go through uh, sort of the background and how we get to why it is a contested topic. So please be mindful and respectful of everyone here. And please try to refrain from sidebar in the chat box as well as inappropriate sort of comments or questions as we are hoping to have this uh, webinar put out on our platforms as a resource for our community. Uh, regarding April 30th. Um, and then one thing I do really want to emphasize tonight is that while uh, as we kind of go through our discussions, um, I want you all to be comfortable to kind of share your experiences um, or opinions or thoughts that you might have regarding um, anything that we cover tonight or anything that you want to mention. Um, so slides with this kind of gold color or font or font will be designated open mic spaces. So um, again, when uh, specifically on those sites, feel free to unmute your microphones and kind of get going um, with discussion, or if you want to chime in on what someone else had mentioned, feel free to do so. I want We want this all to be a space for you to feel comfortable and welcome to share your opinions. Tonight's uh, webinar will kind of go through uh, what you, might already know and what you wonder about uh, April 30th. We'll look at a timeline of events regarding Vietnam, 
uh, we'll get the division of Vietnam as a country, going into the conflict of Vietnam and how we get to the war in Vietnam. We'll kind of look at some perspectives, uh, primary sources regarding the war in Vietnam, and then tying it back to your VSA, your personal or new VSA in the West experiences. Uh, so again, thank you all for sharing um, your VSA and your views, UVSA Midwest experiences so far. And then to conclude, we'll get to April 30th, 1975 and open floor. Uh, the goal of for tonight is to be able to understand the impact of April 30th in the Viet and Vietnamese community and be able to approach and be a part of empowering and reflective community conversations and events. Um, so that we have all this information, but we have some sort of action or some sort of um, agenda to be able to use this for our communities and for our own sakes. So, again, yeah, thank you all for being here. Okay, so I'm going to send in the KWL chart. It's a little Google Doc. It's going to be in the chat. So the purpose of this KWL chart is for us all to convene on what we may know slash think about Vietnam in April 30th, what we, what we wonder about the date slash country, and eventually what we learn from each other, and tonight's convening, convening at the end of the webinar. But only fill out the purple and the green boxes, which is what I know and what I wonder, and we'll leave the orange box at the end of the webinar. Sorry, again, old man with the uh, Zoom handles, so my apologies. But can you all access this form okay? Uh, feel free to be uh, anonymous, or you can kind of um, say with a, whatever you'd like to say. Um, some sentence starters are provided there, so if you kind of need a little sort of help to go with what you'd like to add, uh, feel free to do so. Um, so the first two boxes we added in as examples. So I know that Saigon was remained, renamed to Ho Chi Minh, and I wonder if the French cared about the people in Vietnam during the colonization. But feel free to unmute your microphones um, and kind of uh, mention and kind of talk about whatever you'd like uh, regarding any sort of questions or any sort of thoughts that you might have. There are some questions as well to consider if you're also having trouble uh, sort of brainstorming what you might know or, or what you wonder about regarding the topic or regarding Vietnam in general. Since most of uh, US history um, in our schools here in the United States, the curriculum only covers the war in Vietnam and that's pretty much all that we get regarding our history as the country of Vietnam and that sort of heritage aspect. So feel free to, again, uh, unmute your microphones and um, sort of mention anything that you'd like to add. Sorry, Justin, what did you say about unmuting? Um, you can unmute your microphone and feel free to uh, kind of like talk about uh, what you have or things that you wonder in addition to this. Hmm. Yeah, I can, I can share real quick. Um, so I put down, um, I, I know what led to the American involvement with the war and then, you know, the outcome. Because um, I don't know if many people do know I mean, I'm a big history buff, uh, like a nerd, and I look into stuff like that. Uh, but it, it really kind of started off like um, based off of like miscommunication with the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which is basically, long story short, some American boats thought that they were being attacked, but they weren't. And then the president at the time, Lyndon B. Johnson, just called out the order, and then um, they started bombing North Vietnamese targets. Anyways, um, and then I wonder like 
how this incident, this episode within our parents' events, um, how that affects us and how that will affect like our kids' generation, or if it'll be like, we'll be too far removed and it won't really matter that much. Yeah, that's super important to mention. Thank you for, I'm a history buff too. So like, I, I, I totally see that. But yeah, the Gulf of Tonkin's a very huge um, part of sort of this growing conflict to the US involvement in, the, in this war and how it kind of came to be. So yeah, thank you, Alex, for sharing. Anyone else wanna share? Get about another 30 seconds or so, then we'll kind of transition on to the next part. Hi, this is Tony Doe. Um, I don't have access to a computer, um, but if someone could note take this for me, um, for what I wonder, um, I'm wondering how long, um, how long the oral history of Vietnam will be, uh, how long it will be passed down through generations because in Vietnam there's obviously there's going to be some sort of bias uh, towards what the government there wants uh, their people to know um, and how long that history will also uh, be continued over here in the United States and how the two biases uh, might affect the way that we, we see the history. Thank you, Tony, for asking that question, kind of that wonder of that oral history of Vietnam. It's also really great that you mentioned this uh, idea, this component to um, what we'll be talking about a lot tonight is this idea of generations and how does that affect uh, different generations and how does that um, and change the rhetoric and perspective on how people see April 30th and the history of Vietnam. So thank you, Tony. And thank you, Alex. Um, for the sake of time, we'll continue moving on. But again, if you there's anything you'd like to add on to this, feel free to kind of do so as we go through tonight's discussion. I'll go back to the PowerPoint. So bearing in mind um, what we've kind of looked at so far, I want you to consider the following. What is one historical Vietnamese event that has impacted your life the most? I'll give you about some time to I'll give you like 10 seconds or so to kind of think about what sort of event or experience has impacted your life the most. Um, I know personally, um, living here in the state of Iowa, Governor Ray uh, was instrumental in providing um, or, and opening up Iowa to Thai Dam and um, Vietnam refugees um, in the 1970s. And because of Governor Ray, there's a huge uh, Thai Dam and Viet community here in Iowa, especially in Des Moines, Iowa, where I live. Um, and I think Carolyn just linked um, something from the Iowa Asian Alliance like about Governor Ray. But uh, Governor Ray is definitely it was huge in um, helping my family come here as my parents came here um, by boat. Uh, would anyone like to share a historical, historical piece that impacted their life the most? Um, so I don't know if I have something like that, but uh, I think I saw on the news a couple of years back ago, like how uh, the Vietnamese public were celebrating the LGBT community. Like they were having uh, like, uh, like public events for that. 
And I thought that was really interesting because, you know, typically our parents' generations aren't really like that accepting of uh, that kind of lifestyle. Um, but again, I mentioned of how I am, you know, acquainted and friends with a lot of international Vietnamese and uh, they, uh, they're, they share thoughts of like how uh, you know, the new mindsets with the young people are, are changing the dynamic that, you know, what we read, at least in the U.S. history books about Vietnam and communism, um, and also from what our parents tells us. So, although it's different, I did share this piece with my parents, and uh, they were, frankly, shocked that the Vietnamese people could, you know, change like that and be accepting of people that are different. Thank you, Alex, for mentioning that um, regarding kind of the sociolog sociological aspects of uh, family and education, how that um, permeates into our sort of beliefs and just generational effect on our communities. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next, sorry, there we go. The next part. Uh, we'll kind of look at a condensed timeline. Um, I say condensed because this is not a uh, exclusive uh, timeline of the history of Vietnam. Uh, the events here relate to sort of the power dynamics regarding the country of Vietnam and how we get to April 30th, 1975. Um, and then we will link it here in the chat so you can also view it in your own browser and I'll um, go share it or I'll share the infographic on my screen as well. Um, but as you hop into that infographic, as you look at the timeline and the uh, conclusion to the war, what are some events that you find surprising? And what do you find interesting about the timeline? Um, and again, feel free to kind of unmute your microphones um, and um, kind of mention what you want to mention uh, or chime in on someone else's uh, uh, response as well. I think be for me personally, being a history major, uh, when I learned about sort of the tributary system or uh, the system known as Sinocentrism, where uh, China was the center of the world um, that they believed they were um, from for a long period of time. Uh, Vietnam was a vassal state or a tributary state where we offered gifts um, and or like money or uh, like some sort of military or financial support to China so that we'd be perceived well. And I, I think from that, that leads to some sort of uh, power um, relation as we kind of look through the other things. But again, feel free to uh, unmute your microphones and kind of go through what you'd like to add. I think um, something that I find interesting within Vietnam's history is that Vietnam has always been a country or an area uh, of Southeast Asia that has always been ruled by other people. Um, and we talk about the, the Vietnam War and that only happening like within the last 100 years, but it's been, you know, many hundreds of years that, that people have always wanted power over Vietnam and have had influence into like what Vietnam is or what they do. So I find that pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great point that, you know, becomes a really big reason for um, like Ho Chi Minh to like fight for his ideals during the French colon uh, colonialization. But, you know, even when the French did colonize, like in the early 20th century, during World War II, when the Japanese came, they were also, um, you know, being controlled and used by the Japanese forces as well, um, which not a lot of people recognize or talk about because, uh, 
Um, mainly they talk about like the US and then um, all the human indecencies that they did in, in, in China. So not get much talked about what they what the Japanese people did in uh, Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam. That's a great point to mention about uh, Japan. As Japan became an imperial power throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, as they changed from a more dynastic um, country to a more imperialized and westernized country, like a United States or like a uh, Great Britain. So that's a super, super interesting point to mention, Alex. Thank you. Uh, would anyone else like to mention anything that they find interesting or surprising about either uh, of these? If not, then we'll go ahead and keep rolling with uh, tonight's presentation. Um, and again, we'll come back to this as well. So uh, definitely feel free to keep it up in your browser as well. Um, but yes, thank you, Tyson, Alex. So the division of Vietnam occurred on July 21st, 1954. Um, but before that, there is a Geneva conference where US, Britain, China, Soviet Union, France and Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos was in attendance to negotiate a solution for Southeast Asia. And this resulted in the split of Vietnam, um, the Geneva Accords. So it divided Vietnam in half. And as you can see in the image there, there's the demilitarized zone. That's where it was split. And this division happened, um, occurred from 1954 to 1975. So for North Vietnam, they adopted the flag on November 30th, 1955, and they referred to Democratic Republic of Vietnam. And for South Vietnam, they uh, adopted that flag as shown on the slide on June 14th, 1949, and uh, referred to themselves as Republic of Vietnam. And um, the question that we wanna bring up is what are some differences that you spot between the North and South? It could be anything ranging from culturally or just um, the government or anything. So I'll give a few seconds to discuss that. If not, we'll move on. So one thing I'd like to point, um, so with the map that you see on the right, um, at the time, the northern part, they were more urbanized, it was more populous, and the southern part, um, you know, there's not as populated compared to the north. Uh, just real quickly, in like 1963, they were gonna have like a general election to vote what kind of government system that they were gonna have. And because like the US were afraid, um, because uh, there were more people in the north that they were gonna vote communist anyway, so that's why they also got involved. Um, but uh, real quick too, with North Vietnam, a lot of people, their accents are, are different. Um, that's mainly just because uh, they're closer to China and they have uh, kind of like a Cantonese dialect, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, nowadays, you know, their mannerism is also really different too. Just, just saying. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's a good point to add. Thanks for sharing, Alex. Does anyone else have anything else to share? With that, we can move on to the next slide. All right, so this is about the conflict in Vietnam. So the next few slides will contain, contain direct quotes and perspectives from folks involved in the war in Vietnam from all sides. Um, so we will cover a few slides of the slides in, um, and that the slide decks will be posted online for folks to digest and the rest of the content that we do not have to cover in time um, in the slides. So I will ask the question, how does this quote relate slash affect April 30th, 1975? So if, um, does anyone want to read this? These quotes? So 
So um, I'll just I'll read it for you. Carolyn and I will read it. So the first one is: All men are created created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For more than 80 years, the French imperialists, abusing the standard of liberty, equality, and fraternity, have violated our fatherland and oppressed our fellow citizens. Citizens, President Ho Chi Minh. And the second perspective that we have was President Ho addressing policy, policy decisions. And on quote, he's, uh, they said, now the French are having talks with us while the American imperialists are becoming our main and direct enemy. U.S. policy is to expand and international internationalize the Indochina War. And then just real quick with Indochina War, um, a lot of people refer to the Vietnamese fighting the French as the Indochina War. And then um, they also refer the Vietnam War as the Second Indochina War. Um, so that's what that quote was referring to, to the first one. So going along with that, we have a few more perspective if anyone, so the next slide, we also have a few more if anyone wants to um, take turns reading or anything, that'll be fine. Uh, Cosima, I think you have that one if you want to. So, recognition of basic national rights of the Vietnamese people, peace, independence, sovereign, the sovereign right, unity, and territorial integrity. According to Geneva Agreement, the U.S. government must withdraw from South Vietnam all U.S. troops and cancel its military alliance. And the second perspective um, is from uh, the quote is, the South Vietnamese are losing a war to the Viet Cong. No one can assure you that we can beat the Viet Cong or even force them to the conference table on our teams, no matter how many hundred thousand white foreign troops were deployed. Um, I, I, wanna, I just wanna add something in as we go through this. So these perspectives, as you can kind of see, you see from the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, the Premier, and also the United States Secretary of State here, George Ball. Um, the United States involved itself within the Korean War shortly after World War II ended um, and was fighting uh, a Cold War abroad and a civil, and civil rights uh, domestically. And so once we get to the sort of the conflict that's brewing in Vietnam, there's this Cold War still going on all, all around the world between the Soviet Union and between um, the United States uh, predominantly. Um, and so the Korean War was uh, lost due to um, the United States not knowing really where to put their troops. Uh, as in like what it was with the Pacific War, with the war, with, with, with World War II. Um, they did not know the terrain. So terrain also played a huge component in the war itself. So um, I'm going to send the infographic again for us all in the chat. Um, so, the conflict in Vietnam nears an end in 1973 when peace talks are agreed to. However, fighting continues until early 1975. North Vietnamese troops entered Saigon on April 30th, and April 30th, 1975, and the war in Vietnam officially concluded on July 2nd, 1976. So, how have you seen the war retold in your lives and communities? I'll paste this in the chat. It is also open mic. As you um, begin to uh, 
consider how um, the war in Vietnam has been retold in your lives and communities. Um, think about possibly uh, your parents or your grandparents' experiences um, in Vietnam or here and how it has affected them. Um, you can consider sort of the historical context that we've been uh, referring to. Tyson mentioned uh, how um, Vietnam is also known as a country that's been known to be colonized or ruled by a, another frequently throughout our history. Um, and then Tony did mention something on the uh, KWL chart hearkening back to um, sort of this oral history. So just generally speaking, how have you seen the war retold in your lives and communities? Um, and feel free to kind of yeah, go I'll from there. Here, Justin. Um, so I feel like I've only learned about the Vietnam War uh, history through U.S. textbooks written by uh, the U.S. perspective. Um, within my community or within the Vietnamese community, within my parents and, and relatives, I uh, haven't heard anything about the history, more uh, more of what Tony's talking about, like the uh, the refugee experience and like the, the oral history of what our parents have endured. Um, so I feel like within uh, Vietnamese American, Vietnamese Canadian, uh, or other like uh, Vietnamese um, who have escaped Vietnam during the war era, like those stories are more of uh, the refugee experience and I feel like most parents don't talk about the war uh in a sense of what happened I mean like their 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 experience was like escaping the war they had nothing to do uh with politics like they were just forced to do what they could and uh the U.S. helped out as much as they could to uh to bring refugees out uh out of out of that country. Um, but I feel like for the most part, you know, within our Vietnamese community, there's not a lot of conversation that's talked about within the history of like what has happened because, you know, we don't get to write that history. Like North Vietnam gets to write that history. They, they were the one who won the war. So uh, they were the ones who get to, to write their history. That's a really interesting point to mention about sort of that oral history and who kind of gets to tell what history. And I think that's really important that we mention how um, sort of our parents or our grandparents have had um, those experiences of the refugee experience and how their experiences are not about the war itself, but rather uh, leaving uh, the country for their uh, own reasons. So that was really, uh, Great point, Tyson. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on for this. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead uh, do we have to move on? No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so when I think about like how I like see the war like retold um, to Tyson's point, um, at least in my family, like both of my parents are like refugees. So speaking on behalf of like their experience and how I've come to understand it. Um, it's like, I feel like via culture is very oral. Like there's a lot of oral history that's passed down and the act of like passing that down is like spoken and like not spoken. So when we, when at least I think about like how I came to understand like my parents' experience and how they like see the war, it was the act that they didn't talk about it that that act was how they, how I understood that war and their experience on them. So I think like when, when like I'm, I'm like, okay, well, like I don't really see this chapter in like a U.S. history, like textbook or whatever, but it's the fact that like my dad doesn't really talk about like what happened in the camp. So like my mom doesn't talk about like how she got like, you know, and all these things happened. And I also think about like how the war like lives in like body. Um, and think about like the idea of like intergenerational trauma, like that that act of silence and like what my parents had to go through in that trauma um, that we as like, or, or, or I as like a second generation, like Vietnam American, like I internalize that, right? Um, a lot of how I found like healing in the VSA community was like, I was in community with other 
folks that were like, yeah, like my parents don't talk about it or like my parents were refugees too. And like, there's questions that we have that like around our identity or, or around our culture, around our history that um, we, we are seeking but aren't able to find. And I think that war is, the, is not told in our books, but it's also like the act of our parents, my parents not talking about it that like lives in my relationship with like my identity. So it's not just the act of like knowing what happened, but like the trauma that in like what happened and like the identity that is carved out for me now as like the descendant of refugees that and that history and how that lives on. Yeah, that's a good point, Tagana. I think along with that, too, um, if you think about like assimilation, how Asians assimilate to uh, American culture, I, I, like you lose so much culture within each generation that's passed on. Uh, it, it'll be interesting to see like where our second generation or third generation uh, Vietnamese Americans will take uh, will take this on. And I, I see a lot of culture being passed on through religion uh, with TNTT and I feel like people who don't have uh, that sense of culture or who don't have uh, that community that instill the culture uh, into their children uh, will lose it a lot faster. So I think uh, that's a good point to go on. It's really scary. I feel like uh, more people need to write about this to document these experiences. And uh, real quickly for those, uh, just everybody, um, Sometimes it is, you know, important to try to have these conversations with our parents or whoever else, um, you know, because once they're gone, they're gone, and you won't have those stories, we won't keep it anymore, and they just uh, kind of disappear out of existence. And sometimes they do want to share these experiences and want their grandkids to know about what happened. Um, but not just what happened in Vietnam, but also what they went through when they first came to the U.S. Like, what was their first job? How did they get housing? And how did they basically, you know, take all of this risk to leave everything that they know in their home country and come to a foreign land and try to make a foundation for a family and for us to thrive? Um, those are some conversations that, that, you know, not everybody will have, but if we have the opportunity, that would be, um, yeah, definitely something to have. So. Those are really great points um, to mention. Um, so thank you all for sharing. And, um, and again, Alex, for mentioning how uh, we go having these conversations and um, going back to our families or those around us being able to have those conversations with them about their experiences and how uh, we can um, continue to relive and have these opportunities to um, have these conversations as well. Uh, we'll continue moving on. I know it's eight o'clock Central Standard Time, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, so for the sake of time, we'll probably try to cut down the amount of discussion uh, just so um, people can kind of get through what we have planned and so people can uh, get going to what they need to and their other uh, responsibilities. Uh, but thank you again so far for everything. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. Yeah, so thank you for everyone sharing your perspectives and to go along with that, um, keeping in mind the things that we've heard throughout tonight's discussion and what we talked about before, this kind of goes along with it. Um, this is another discussion-based slide where I just want to see your personal experiences and engage the audience and discuss the question, are there generations of Viet or Viet American folks that celebrate differently April 30th? Or does your family commemorate or celebrate th April 30th or doesn't at all? So bearing in mind, I'll add this to the chat, some things to think about. Bearing in mind what you've heard or experienced growing up from those around you, does your family 
And what are some stories or mannerisms that those have shown or expressed regarding this? So you can consider uh, geographical locations, upbringing, and like celebration community events. So I'll have like one or two people share about this to, for the sake of time. Um, personally, my family has never celebrated April 30th. I know a lot of communities across the United States, they um, kind of talk about April 30th. I know a lot of second generation or like just younger generations of Vietnamese youth, they choose to change their profile pictures on Facebook or make posts just like talking about April 30th. But personally in Indiana, like I don't think a lot of um, Vietnamese refugees choose to talk about it. Just because I know personally, my parents find the war to be something very traumatic. I've talked about their experiences and they talk about it very casually, but I think that is kind of like a lot of internalized trauma that they try not to think about. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Kevin. Um, yeah, a lot of families do do not celebrate it at all. They put it in the back of their mind just because of the history behind it and everything. Um, some families do, um, but most of the times don't at the same time. But yeah. Uh, just real quickly. Um, so when I first joined the VSA at the time, it wasn't really a VSA, it's more like a a group of international Vietnamese. Um, but when we were talking about like what to do in the month of April, uh, they're just used to the celebration of a April 30th as the reunification day, something to be celebrated about um, bringing two halves of Vietnam together and being in their, in their view, uh, free and independent from other nations. Um, and that is something, you know, definitely worth celebrating in their eyes, uh, especially after, you know, a decade of war. Um, so that, that is what they do, like their perspective. So just wanted to offer that for everyone else to hear. Thank you, Alex. Again, thank you, everyone, for sharing. Um, really appreciate it. Um, and again, all these uh, slides and all the resources that you have seen tonight, they are, will be posted online on our platform, so you will be able to see them. So now that we've sort of talked about the history of Vietnam and how we get to uh, the end of the war, we get to April 30th, uh, the date that is known within our communities as the fall of Saigon or Black April, as well as the reunif re reunification day or liberation day. And these pictures were on the slides from the, on the previous slide. So on the picture on the left, uh, there's an Air America helicopter evacuating uh, Viet families and officials uh, from Saigon. And this is a pretty uh, popular picture in uh, textbooks and um, circulating online regarding the end of the war in Vietnam. And then on the picture on the right, which was in uh, May, uh, 1975, there's people marching in Saigon, celebrating a liberation of the South. And as you can see between these two sides, there are stark contrasts between um, uh, what is being shown here um, and who is being shown here. So uh, those are just some things to consider. And we'll go, on, go ahead and uh, keep moving forward. Again, if you need to uh, leave for another uh, um, responsibility or something they have going on, uh, uh, feel free to do so. Again, everything will be posted online. So thank you. So generally speaking, we know that April 30th is seen differently within our community. This is why we have the space and time for us as a younger generation to be able to provide a space to bridge conversations and perspectives for folks in our community that have heard and have not heard why April 30th is seen differently and why we are having this conversation today. So um, the question I ask you all is overall, how has the war impacted you and your family? And for the sake of time, we'll open it up for at least one or two speakers.
Um, I know personally, my dad and his, uh, my grandpa, uh, they left uh, Saigon and they uh, enrolled in like refugee camps um, and travel along the Mekong River um, and route to uh, leaving Vietnam. And they stayed in Cambodia as well before coming here. And I know um, sort of that experience might be similar to uh, your family's experiences, but that's how the war has impacted uh, my family. Um, I know my mom hasn't mentioned a whole lot um, regarding the war, but my dad's been uh, pretty adamant regarding his experience. Um, and we'll go ahead and continue moving. Um, so again, you don't have to share, but uh, you are more than welcome to do so. So now that we've looked at the war and how it's impacted us in terms of generational impacts um, and other sort of uh, components, we'll sort of get to the conclusion of our webinar as we get to wrap it up. So what do you think are some other names for the war itself? Anyone want to take a guess at other names for uh, the war in Vietnam? What have you seen or heard? Alex mentioned in one of them, the Indochina War or Second Indochina War. That's an excellent point, the Second Indochina War. Thank you, Tyson. I don't think I had that on the list, so I'll make sure to add it. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, there's a uh, somewhat relatively new narrative of calling it the American War. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just because of after reviewing like how America got involved, um, it just seems a little odd and seems it was more like there. Yeah. That's a good point to mention, Alex, um, regarding that rhetoric of the uh, quote American war in Vietnam. I know my history teacher, who's like my mentor, um, he used that when I was a junior in high school, he said the American war in Vietnam and pointed to like this principle of American exceptionalism um, of the US wanting to involve itself in a lot of conflicts, like for example, the war in Vietnam. So um, it's a very interesting take on it. And uh, we'll, we'll kind of look at uh, some of the other names that uh, Pele and I have uh, compiled. Pele Lei is our, uh, one of our board of directors members. So uh, like Alex mentioned, um, it's also known as the American War in Vietnam. That's one way of saying it. Um, we've seen it as the Vietnam War, oftentimes in US uh, curriculums and uh, classes growing up. Uh, it's also known as the proxy war um, since this is after World War II ends in 1945 that begins the Cold War up until the US, uh, Soviet Union disbands um, and it's also known as the Civil War. Okay so as we wrap we start to wrap up our conversation night on April 30th Please um, remember that what you know and what you learn is a tool for you to provide to other folks in your life and community. So we can sit here and talk about these topics all we want, but let's do our part and bridge the conversation between folks who only know one perspective or don't even know why April 30th is a contested topic in Viet in um, Viet American leaders in our organization. So let's spread our platform and use our privileges to open up to others others' perspectives and knowledges by having these conversations conversation and so on the slide there's a list of call to action that you could do um, to do your part and it's super important for us as uh, young Viet or long young APIDA leaders and uh, within our communities to continue to uh, be involved with our communities and have action to the words and efforts that we put in within our organizations. 
Um, so this is just of a list that we have compiled internally, but um, if there's anything else that is on this list and you feel that there's a call to action, do so. Um, that's what we're here to do is encourage and empower you to uh, have these conversations. And um, for those that are leaders within your community, whether it be VSA or any other organization, um, yeah, definitely having uh, conversations with this with your general members, or even having like a slide in your what is it called mass meetings or general body meetings, just to like discuss like on this day what happened kind of thing with Vietnam um, way back then, um, just so that we can in, you know provide that resource and education with our general body members so that they're better will verse with this too. Thank you, Alex, for mentioning that. Continue to um, provide resources for your communities and for your organizations, all that you're involved in. The more that you can provide, the more that everyone else can learn, and the more that you learn as well about yourself and your experiences. Uh, so we'll continue sort of this conclusion um so at we've arrived at the end of our discussion tonight and i know for the sake of time we've gone past so thank you all for staying and for being here um some things to note if you'd like to go back to the kwl chart and put down things that you've learned or things that you still wonder um about you are welcome to do so um, i think we're going to post that as well um, for our communities to see um, but also some general questions to consider. Um, have you seen the word Vietnam communicated? And what is something surprising or something that you learned today? And we'll come back to this. Um, we'll officially conclude, but if, we'll keep the call open if you'd like to um, come back to this slide and um, talk about what you like would like to mention. So um, if you'd like to connect with internal staff, this is our, all our social media links, um, our, e our UVS and West email, Instagram, LinkedIn, portfolios, et cetera, YouTube channel. So stay connected. And then um, here are all of our platforms for UVS and Midwest, um, our Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and our website as well. Um, so feel free to connect with us here, see what we do, see, um, uh, all the content that we're uh, posting and pushing out. Um, but yes, um, that sort of officially concludes tonight's webinar. Um, again, we'll post all the resources that you've seen tonight here on our platforms once uh, we look through everything. Um, but the KWL chart, the timeline, the slide deck itself, everything will be sent out for our communities to see. Uh, but thank you everyone for coming to tonight's webinar. Uh, we really appreciate your time by being here and your participation of being able to have these conversations. Um, so we, all we ask is that you continue to uh, reflect on uh, your experiences uh, and those experiences of those around you and what you can do to um, have continue to have these conversations and why um, they're important to you or to those around you. Um, but again, thank you everyone for being here. I want to give a big thank you to Pele and Tigana. Pele couldn't be here tonight because he has a class, uh, but they're both instrumental in helping out with guiding this conversation. And uh, real quick on Pele's behalf, um, so UVSA Midwest is going to have a virtual activism retreat sometime in May. Um, so more information about that later on. But if y'all are interested, y'all can just ping us a message about it. Um, but we should like release some kind of more information about that um, within the next few weeks. So we just wanted to have this open space for um, anyone that did want to you know, further discuss in like today's climate and whatnot. Okay.
Uh, so I put in the chat, I'm going to take a quick photo <laughs> of all, even though not all of us are, are faces, but it's okay. It's going to be for Instagram. Um, give me a moment. Okay. Yeah, you ready? Oh, yeah, I look beautiful. You can clearly see. Yeah, me. you look amazing. Okay. Because next top cool. model, I know. I didn't, I didn't shave Kasima. Actually, I can. I know. I want to just take a screenshot. Okay. One, two, three. All right, cool. I got a screenshot. I got your your clapping emoji, Maya. Um, thank you again, everyone, for coming. We really appreciate you being here and spending your part of your Wednesday night here with us. Um, if there's any sort of questions, you can direct it to us, internal staff, or executive board, or board of directors. I have a question. Yes, sir. I have a question for internal staff. Um, so you all really drove to have this conversation and this webinar take place. For you all, why do you think this conversation was important? Um, I think it's important because, like in the slides, not a lot of people, a lot of the younger generation, they're very, they grew up in America, so they don't know about April 30th, so they don't know the history of Vietnam, they're very, I would say, um, influenced by the Western culture, so there's not a lot of, and plus a lot of people don't really talk about it, like I personally also didn't know about April 30th, like I saw it on Facebook and I was like, okay, what is April 30th, and so I had to do some research over it. So I think it's important to know at least um, some of your history about Vietnam and just like, so you can tell, keep the history going and tell the, tell the um, rich kids about it, the future kids and the future children. I just said kids twice, but um, future, the younger generation, the future leaders to learn more about the history. I think to echo on uh, with what Kasima mentioned, it's just important that we have a space to have these discussions, that we can all come together and be able to grow from each other and learn from each other's uh, experiences. Um, since all of us are connected one way or another through VSA or UVS and West or some sort of or other organization. So being able to have this space for us to convene on to talk about such a topic that relates to our, our identities or um, experiences or identities within our communities. It's really important for us to have, and I'm just glad that we're able to do so. So I know like uh, for a select few individuals that did speak a lot, like myself included. Just wondering if anybody else wanted to have any input or would like to have some questions asked. When's the next webinar? That's a good question, Tony. Um, TBD. Yeah, TBD. For, for, for the folks that feel like they have a more kind of, cause like we, there, I, I heard a lot of themes around like, this isn't talked about, like this isn't in our history books for, for folks who have a more are, are more comfortable with this material with this history um what resources can other folks um tap into um connect with or um read or check out so they themselves can be more informed about this Uh, yeah, Justin, you can go. No, you can go ahead, Alex. Okay, I was just uh, to say um, a lot of information that I know is like um, just historical accounts. Um, but I think something that's really popular is Vit Tan Wien's, um novel and how he kind of characterized the war. Uh, from a Vinny spy. Uh, again, it is a novel, but still a, a lot of true facts are pulled from it to bring that realism into play for his novel. Um, there's, there's, 
Oh. Oh yes. Oh hi. <laughs> um, there is a what a good resource that I found. It's a doc, it's a series um of documentaries by Ken Burns about the Vietnam War, which uh, it's very informational. Um, and you know, informative for me personally. Um, for some coming from someone that actually studies this. Well, I studied kind of like pre follow Saigon, but I know that Ken Burns does a really good take on the Vietnam War in his series, his documentary series. I believe it's on PBS um, and you can stream it for free. But yeah. Um, I also watch like a lot of the history videos on YouTube and I do show like my parents um, there's two that I watch a lot and, and it kind of makes history a little bit more interesting with this animation and whatnot um, called Simple History and Extra History. Um, both of them, they, it's still surface level information, but it still delivers the content in a way, you know, where it's easy to understand and grasp it. Um, yeah, so like with Extra History, they did a video about the Gulf of Tonkin incident and explained like how that dragged the U.S. into the war in 1964 or three, 1963, something like that. 1964. Yeah, thanks, y'all. Um, internal staff, if if we can make like a running list of some of the recommendations um, that folks shared, we can get like links to those and then s send them out with like the, the webinar materials too. Um, I, I would like to offer folks who like have a curiosity and like this history and also deepen, kind of deepening our like analysis of like the war and its like impact um, through conversation. Um, I think that because the lived memory of like the the impact of like the Vietnam War and like the perspectives and like whatnot are often buried in like what is shared and what is not shared. I think something to name is that having conversations with folks that 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 offer a diversity of perspectives in that history, whether that's like folks that are like second generation, third generation, 1.5, first generation, uh, folks from um, the North, folks from the South, um, folks that live in Vietnam now or, you know, we re, uh, recently immigrated here um, and like how they experience or their relationship with with that history is important to expand the way in which we 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 see this topic because um, I think it 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 may be like a generalization to to assume that like these these were like th this is our understanding of like you know the north or the south um and this is our perspective and like um how others may may potentially see the war in vietnam but i think it's it's a very it, it's always a like a a humbling experience to talk to folks who um sit at different vantage points at with like centering the the war in vietnam as like the topic but also holding space for other people and their perspectives to um be heard and live um in existence and i know that a lot of the demographic um in our communities be may may make up a lot of you know, descendants of like refugees or, um, you know, second, um, third generation, like Vietnamese Americans. Um, so that is um, an avenue for us to explore um, and bridging those connections with um, kind of piecing together that, you know, tapestry of like history that we're trying to all um, kind of weave together um, as we solidify, you know, our uh, roots here in America.
That's a great point to mention, Tiana. Uh, thank you. As we, uh, it's almost 8.30 Central Standard, 9.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time. So um, again, the webinar has like officially concluded. So if you do need to go to a different uh, event or some sort of uh, other things going on on your Wednesday night, feel free to do so. Um, but again, thank you all for being here and for sharing your perspectives and your experiences. Uh, we really appreciate it as internal staff and as UVSA in the West that you all are here uh, and to have these conversations. I'm sorry you can't see my face. I don't know what's going on with my computer today. Just not a fan of me today. But um, again, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate you being here. After this, we'll continue to uh, work to see uh, when we'll push out the all these materials and as well as the ongoing list of resources uh, for you all to see. Um, so be on the lookout um, the next week or so to see these resources uh, be released on our platforms and our website as well. So um, again, thank you all for being here. We all re really appreciate your time and uh, your perspectives. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.